This is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Lost in Space Space, the final frontier. The cultural quip has become an unconscious motivator for humanity's exploration of the cosmos. We dream of one day colonizing distant worlds and ushering in an era akin to the utopian future depicted in the beloved science fiction franchise Star Trek. However, the truth is, humanity's journey into space is still in its infancy, and our initial motivation to venture beyond Earth's atmosphere was derived not from a sense of wonder and insatiable curiosity, but rather from the tense climate of fear and one-upmanship that defined the Cold War era. In the late 1950s, the Soviet Union captured the world's attention by launching Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. This technological achievement sparked concerns in the United States that the communist nation had gained an insidious lead in the arms race. In response, the fledgling U.S. space program was accelerated, fueled by the fear of the enemy's perceived superiority. This kicked off what became known as the space race between the two superpowers. Since those first tentative steps into space over 60 years ago, a total of 565 people have ventured beyond Earth's atmosphere and into the unknown, including 65 women and 500 men from 41 different countries. In addition to this elite group of astronauts and cosmonauts, humanity has sent a diverse array of animal companions to pave the way, including dogs, monkeys, rabbits, tortoises, newts, and even spiders. With so many individuals having slipped the surly bonds of Earth over the decades, one question persists. Has anyone ever been truly lost in the vast expanse of space? The short answer is no. There has never been a case where a crew member has become untethered from their spacecraft or space station and drifted off into the endless void, doomed to succumb to the harsh vacuum. However, there was one harrowing incident that brought humanity perilously close to such a catastrophic scenario. A story of survival against all odds, of human ingenuity and perseverance in the face of crisis. A story that captivated the entire world and solidified the capabilities of NASA in the minds of millions. This is the story of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission in 1970, which came terrifyingly close to being forever marooned in the depths of space with no hope of rescue or return to the safety of Earth. In the tense geopolitical climate of the Cold War era, the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in an ideological battle for technological superiority and ideological dominance on the world stage. When the Russians successfully launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, in 1957, it was seen as a potential threat to national security in America. If the Soviets could put a satellite into orbit, could they one day launch nuclear missiles across continents? This sparked fears that the communist nation had gained an alarming lead not just in the emerging space race, but in rocket technology as a whole. The United States could ill afford to be seen as second-rate in the technological arena. Something had to be done to reassert America's preeminence and shore up morale on the home front. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy issued a daring challenge to the nation before a joint session of Congress to put an American on the moon before the end of the decade. Kennedy proclaimed, no single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Claiming the moon would be a symbol of American courage, ingenuity, and unwavering determination in the face of Soviet advances. With Kennedy's ambitious moonshot providing clear direction, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, began working at a feverish pace. A series of uncrewed missions tested rockets, spacecraft capabilities, and procedures throughout the early 1960s under the newly instituted Apollo program. In 1967, the first crewed Apollo mission was scheduled but ended in tragedy when a fire killed the three astronaut crew during a launch rehearsal test. Undeterred, NASA pressed on after implementing safety reforms. Finally, in 1968, the first crewed Apollo mission circumnavigated the moon in preparation for an eventual lunar landing attempt. Apollo 10 came agonizingly close with the lunar lander descending to within 50,000 feet of the surface before returning to the orbiting command module. The monumental goal was finally achieved on July 20th, 1969, when Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made history by becoming the first humans to walk on the lunar surface. 
As Armstrong stepped onto the dusty lunar plane, his words echoed around the world. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. America had beaten the Soviets and restored faith in its technological superiority. Four more crewed missions landed on the moon over the next three years in the relentless pursuit of scientific knowledge. But after the crowning achievement of Apollo 11, the next most famous episode in NASA's illustrious history was still to come, the perilous saga of Apollo 13. To fully grasp the extraordinary feat of safely returning the Apollo 13 crew back to Earth after their harrowing experience, one must first understand the basic design of the spacecraft and the complex mission profile that was intended before things went catastrophically awry. The Apollo spacecraft consisted of three main components. The conical command module designed for entry and splashdown phases, the service module containing the main propulsion system and consumables, and the spidery lunar module meant for the actual landing on the lunar surface by two of the three crew members. For the journey out to the moon, the command and service modules remained docked together, with the lunar module nestled ahead acting as a third component. Once in lunar orbit, the lunar module would detach and descend to the surface with two astronauts aboard while the third remained in orbit piloting the command slash service module mothership. After completion of surface operations, the lunar module's ascent stage would blast off from the moon and redock with the orbiting command module being jettisoned as dead weight. Finally, the service module engine would fire to propel the command module out of lunar orbit and on a trajectory back towards Earth, where it would eventually jettison the now spent service module segment before punching through the atmosphere for splashdown and recovery. For Apollo 13, the prime crew consisted of Jim Lavelle as mission commander, Fred Hayes as the lunar module pilot, and Jack Swigert as the command module pilot. The mission launched on April 11, 1970, atop a massive Saturn V rocket from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Over the next three and a half days, the spacecraft would gradually make course corrections using its main engines while the crew prepared for arrival at the moon and the landing sequence in the Fra Mauro Highlands region. This landing site was chosen to allow study of the ancient crater cone and the composition of the lunar highlands terrain. However, Less than 56 hours into the mission while the crew was providing a live television broadcast from space, disaster struck in the form of a service module oxygen tank rupture and subsequent explosion. This crippled the electrical system and caused the spacecraft to rapidly lose oxygen, the critical consumable that made the remainder of the mission possible. As live television footage rolled, millions on Earth heard Lovell's now famous words, Houston, we've had a problem. At Mission Control, engineers scrambled to understand the nature of the malfunction as the reality set in that the lunar landing was no longer an option. The primary goal was now the safe return of the three astronauts after overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. With the service module critically damaged and resources rapidly depleting, the Apollo 13 crew found themselves in an incredibly precarious situation. Time was running out as oxygen vented into the vacuum of space and power levels dropped precipitously. Ground controllers at Mission Control in Houston quickly realized the harrowing truth. These three men were essentially lost in space aboard a crippled spacecraft hundreds of thousands of miles from Earth. The crew had to act quickly and decisively to have any hope of survival. After emergency consultations with Mission Control, the only viable option emerged. Utilize the lunar module itself as a lifeboat to provide basic life support for the journey back home. However, this presented its own set of complex challenges. The lunar module, known as Aquarius, was designed to support two people for just over a day on the lunar surface. Now it would have to keep all three crew members alive for nearly four days as they made the long trek back from the deep space. Life support capabilities like oxygen supply, carbon dioxide removal, and power would be stretched to the absolute limits. One of the most pressing issues was the buildup of carbon dioxide as the crew expelled it through respiration. Too high a concentration would incapacitate the astronauts through toxic hypoxia. Unfortunately, the cylindrical carbon dioxide scrubbers from the command module were wildly incompatible with the square receptacles in the lunar module. In an impressive demonstration of ingenuity, 
Mission control engineers rapidly prototyped an improvised solution to this dilemma using a plastic bag, hose, duct tape, and a unique sock and towel arrangement to connect the cubic command module scrubbers to the lunar module system. The crew then had to quickly construct this jerry-rigged device on their own while relaying updates to Earth. Power was also an immense concern. The lunar module's batteries were not designed for the extended duration needed. By shutting down virtually all non-essential systems and survival equipment in the command module and carefully monitoring power consumption, the crew managed to cold soak and extend battery life as long as possible. Meanwhile, Mission Control meticulously calculated a trajectory to slingshot the spacecraft around the far side of the moon and get the crew on a course back to Earth using a critical mid-course correction burn from the lunar module's own reaction control thrusters. But this maneuver pushed the craft's Delta V capabilities to their absolute red line. If the burn did not go exactly as planned, the crew would miss Earth entirely upon their return and become permanently marooned with no way to adjust course. The cold reality was that any number of factors could have led to this worst case scenario of the men being stranded in perpetual orbit until their resources ran out completely. Despite the overwhelming odds stacked against them, the crew demonstrated remarkable calm and resilience throughout the ordeal. Even if the Apollo 13 crew managed to make it back to Earth's vicinity after their desperate circumnavigation of the moon, they still face one of the most perilous parts of any space mission, re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. This phase is often referred to as the burning homecoming and with good reason. Upon reaching the outer fringes of the atmosphere after coasting inbound from the moon's gravity, the command module would have to hit an extremely precise entry corridor just 20 miles wide while being decelerated from 25,000 miles per hour to under 200 miles per hour in a matter of minutes. If the angle was too steep, the immense friction would cause the capsule to burn up like a meteor before any hope of parachute deployment but if the entry was too shallow, the craft would skip off the upper atmosphere like a flat stone skipping across a pond, missing the chance to slow down and achieve orbit entirely. Either scenario would be absolutely catastrophic for the crew's already monumental struggle to get that far. The entry angle had to hit a narrow window between 5.5 and 7.5 degrees. Anything outside those parameters and the mission would be lost along with the lives of the three brave astronauts aboard. Making matters even more daunting, the command module's computer navigation would be unusable due to earlier power failures. The crew would essentially be flying the critical re-entry sequence manually, using nothing but their wits and makeshift guidance techniques to hit a target no wider than a neighborhood block from an altitude higher than orbital path. But even before facing that arduous challenge, the men had already endured four agonizing days in the hostile environment of the lunar module designed just for two people for 36 hours on the surface. Conditions were bleak, rations and water were extremely limited, temperatures dropped to near freezing, and they were forced to endure a carbon dioxide buildup that left them fatigued and with constant headaches. At one point, astronaut Fred Hayes was struck with a life-threatening case of dehydration and high fever. His crewmates had to hastily construct water condensation traps and huddle together to stabilize his temperature and fluid levels. Even bodily waste management became a major ordeal, with the crew forced to store their urine rather than venting so as to not alter the spacecraft's trajectory. As the battered Apollo 13 command module approached the outer fringes of the Earth's atmosphere after its long nightmare journey around the moon, the three crew members braced for arguably the most perilous leg of their odyssey the high-speed re-entry and descent to the surface below. The heat shield on the command module's blunt cone had been designed to protect the craft against temperatures up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit during its screaming descent from lunar velocities. However, there were fears the explosive decompression from the earlier oxygen tank rupture may have compromised the shield's integrity. A breach could easily prove catastrophic. Making matters even more precarious, the command module's computer navigation system had been rendered inoperable by the power down procedures required to conserve precious battery life and electrical resources over the past four days. This meant the crew would essentially be flying the critical re entry sequence manually using only rudimentary techniques. In the hours before atmospheric entry, Mission Control relayed a precise re entry trajectory to the crew based on hundreds of calculations and simulations. Their target entry corridor was just 20 miles wide, stray outside these perimeters and the craft could skip off the atmosphere and be doomed to keep orbiting indefinitely until its supplies ran out. 
The astronauts would need to rely on visually lining up the Earth's horizon in their tiny windows and firing the remaining reaction control thrusters at exact intervals by hand to maintain the optimal angle of attack. One mistake or miscalculation could easily mean the difference between a safe splashdown and a tragic fireball disintegration over the Pacific. As the moment of re-entry approached, the eyes of the entire world were fixated on the recovery zone. People of all religions, nationalities, and cultural backgrounds joined in fervent hopes and prayers for the safe return of the embattled crew. Even the slimmest chance of their survival seemed like a miracle after everything they had endured over the past nine days. At Mission Control, controllers, engineers, and NASA leadership maintained their intense focus but were emotionally and physically drained from working around the clock to bring this crisis to resolution. The stakes could not have been higher as the charred command module and its brave inhabitants crossed the entry interface at over 25,000 miles per hour. An agonizing four-minute communications blackout accompanied the capsule's high speed punching through the atmosphere, ionized gas surrounding the craft blocking all radio signals. Those watching could only imagine the massive forces buffeting the tiny vehicle as it shrieked across the sky like a meteor. When the scheduled blackout time came and went with no word from the spacecraft, a hush fell over mission control. Had the worst case scenario played out? Had the heat shield failed? Nerves became increasingly frayed with each passing moment of silence. Then finally, the voice of Jack Swigger crackled through amid bursts of static. Okay, Joe, we've had a pretty good jolt. The crew was alive, battered but advancing towards a safe splashdown. In the weeks and months after the safe return of the Apollo 13 crew, NASA's Accident Review Board conducted an extensive investigation to determine the root cause of the catastrophic explosion that set the drama in motion. Their findings highlighted an issue stemming from an oversight in quality control procedures during the manufacturing process. The culprit was one of the two oxygen tanks in the service module that had been redesigned for the Apollo 13 mission. As part of weight reduction efforts, the tank had been modified with a powerful new thermally insulated material. However, the exposed wiring near the tank was not properly upgraded to handle the much higher electrical loads being carried by the new heater system. Over the course of several launch rehearsals where the tanks were loaded and cycled through pressure changes, this excessive current gradually degraded and compromised the wire insulation inside the tank. A stray spark or bit of conducting material from the fraying wires was all it took to ignite the highly combustible liquid oxygen and cause the massive rupture that critically crippled the spacecraft. While the explosion was certainly a terrifying and unexpected event for the crew of Lavelle, Hayes, and Swigert, their unflappable professionalism and ability to remain calm under extreme duress averted an almost certain tragedy. Their names would become indelibly etched into history alongside other icons of aerospace accomplishment. Upon their return home as internationally celebrated heroes, the crew received a televised greeting from President Richard Nixon along with the highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. They were awarded parades, got to appear on all the major TV shows and speaking circuits, had airports named after them, and even had a crater on the moon officially christened Crater Lavelle by NASA. The incredible feats of getting this crew home safely were the result of the heroic determination of the astronauts themselves, as well as the tireless efforts of hundreds of support staff, engineers, and controllers in Houston working around the clock to improvise solutions. It was a truly shining example of American ingenuity, never-say-die spirit, and management of seemingly insurmountable odds. The artifacts from the mission itself, including the damaged service model that was jettisoned just prior to re-entry, were scattered and lost to the depths when they slammed into the Pacific at over 200 miles per hour upon separation. However, the humble but now legendary command module named Yankee Clipper, that proved as reliable as its sailing ship namesake, did make it back to Earth intact. After its successful splashdown and recovery in the South Pacific by the USS Iwo Jima, the capsule was preserved for posterity. It has since gone on a world tour, been featured at presidential libraries, and now resides on permanent display as part of the astronaut exhibit at the Cosmosphere Aerospace Museum in Hutchinson, Kansas. A lasting monument to one of NASA's finest hours and humanity's incredible drive to overcome any obstacle and prevail. The harrowing ordeal of Apollo 13, where astronauts narrowly escaped disaster, serves as a poignant lesson in the annals of space exploration. This mission underscored the perils that lurk beyond our atmosphere, 
where the margin for error is razor thin and the consequences of failure can be catastrophic. As we stand on the threshold of a new era of space exploration, spearheaded by visionaries like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the specter of malfunction looms large, reminding us of the inherent risks of venturing into the cosmos. In recent years, the ambitions of private space ventures have skyrocketed, with companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin pushing the envelope of what's possible. Their sights are not just set on the moon, but on Mars and beyond, aiming to transform humanity into a multi-planetary species. This bold vision comes with unprecedented challenges and the potential for failures that could echo the tribulations of Apollo 13. The moon, our celestial next-door neighbor, has been the focus of human space exploration for decades. Yet, even at this relatively close distance, the Apollo missions faced immense challenges. The Void Beyond, especially missions to Mars, presents an exponentially greater challenge. Mars is not only vastly further away than the Moon, making rescue or quick return impossible, but also hosts a hostile environment with its own set of unknowns. What happens then when a malfunction occurs not just a few days from Earth, but millions of miles away, isolated on the Red Planet? While our past might not have any people officially lost in space, our future remains cryptic. 